important work you're doing, Mr. George. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, this week for Coffee Talk, we have September, who is with the Cameron Art Museum, who has graciously just um, agreed to spend some time with us this morning telling us about the museum and everything that they do and what's going on over there. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Rachel said, my name is September, and I am the Director of Lifelong Learning at the Cameron Art Museum. So what it really means is that I get to do wonderful things within education at the museum, and that can be education for anything with uh, children and K-12 on through adult learning. Um, and I also am able to be part of community engagement projects. So I'll share some of that information with you with images that I have from the past um, year as we uh, came out of all of the craziness of 2020 with the museum being closed uh, into where we are now with a return to in-person classes and lots of activities taking place at the museum. Um, and just out of curiosity, Mr. George, have you been to the museum before? Have you yes. visited Cameron? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's um, what what thought might you have about or memory do you have of being at the museum? I guess one of the things is some of the exhibits you do not you don't really realize what they are until you go there. You know, yeah. Because, uh, you don't you don't think about certain things being in the museum until you get there and go, oh, I remember that. You know that kind of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's the beauty of being in a space and experiencing art. It triggers ideas from your own personal history or it triggers ideas about um, the regional history, our environment. Um, and you need time in that space to have that moment occur. Um, so I'll show you again a little bit about what's in our galleries, as well as all kinds of things that we have available for education right now. Uh, so let me share my screen. <laughs> and uh, we'll take a look at our museum. So we are located on uh, South 17th Street. We've got a nine acre complex there, a very modern building uh, set in amongst some really, really ancient pines. We just had um, Andy Fairbanks come from the uh, Halliburton Park, and she was part, he was part of a tour that we had uh, with a workshop, and I gained a lot of knowledge about the longleaf pine um, and actually the history of the area, the bay where the uh, museum is actually located. So very modern building set in some really uh, beautiful landscaped uh, area of longleaf pines um, as part of our campus. And so I thought I would share an image from 2020 that many of you may have remembered if you went past the museum while we were shut down um, as part of our campaign to connect with everyone. Um, we had our really friendly ducks on the buildings and on the ground. So even if you couldn't be there, you could see the ducks parading around the, the grounds and they became kind of a mascot for wash your webs, uh, but also connect with Cam. Um, and within that year, um, we also tried to connect with the community by doing community projects where there was something that you could pick up as a kit from the museum. And then it became part of a larger installation on the grounds. And one of those events was our 19th Amendment banner. Uh, so you're looking here at a couple of images of um, one of our volunteers and docents. This is Bobby on the left, and she's holding up some of the individual tiles that were sent in. So members of the community made the individual tiles that you see in the large banner on the right. And that banner is the 19th Amendment. This was the um, anniversary of the uh, amendment for the women's right to vote. And so each one of those tiles was made by someone in the community. And I'll uh, challenge you um, to see if anyone knows. Um, so this is one of the letters S and you're looking here at an early suffragist. Uh, and I'm wondering if anyone knows the year when we had one of the largest um, 
parades for the women's right to vote. So this would have been before 1920. Um, anyone know what year that large march in Washington took place? Or any guess? No, <laughs> it's it being wrong is a lovely thing because in the end you just learn this is not Jeopardy. There's no points or prizes, um, but you're looking here at an image of one of the suffragists from 1913, and this parade took place just the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration, on the same streets and the same um, actual uh, journey that he would take the next day in his presidential inauguration. So tiles like this help tell the story of the 19th Amendment. And one more question, can you imagine in this past year, who was a woman that might have appeared many, many times on our banner? Any guess who that might have been? I'll give you a clue. Who do you think that might represent? So, the Supreme Court Justice, um, you, uh, so, is it Sotomayor? You're, no, she is still with us, but it was no, Ruth but Bader, another one. The other yes. one. I can't remember her name. That's right. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She passed yeah, away yeah. this past year. You, yeah, exactly. And we probably had, we had almost a dozen tiles that were dedicated to her. So again, this was just an opportunity for people to um, get a tile and take part in this banner. And that banner just came down at the end of um, Women's History Month in March. So we had that activity. We also had our annual um, critter event. Clyde's Critters is something that has been taking place at Christmas time for uh, many years now. He's a, a regional artist, North Carolina folk artist, who um, started uh, painting and, and drawing and making these interesting sculptures. And he has a real close heart to Ann Brennan, the executive director of the museum. And his critters have been featured at the museum every Christmas for years now. So that also became something that was a virtual experience where you could pick up a critter, make it at home. Uh, we also had one day with socially distanced activities of painting the critters on site. And then the final installation for Christmas look like this. Um, so this is something that, again, we'll continue to do in a way that people can work at home while they, where they still feel safe, but then be part of a community installation at the museum. And Floating Lanterns is another annual event that became something virtual. And Floating Lanterns is an opportunity for you to share a memory of someone. Uh, so you are able to color or draw or paint on a lantern sleeve. And then these lanterns get set afloat in January on an evening of remembrance for um, anyone in any way that you want to express. So of course, there were some really heartfelt and even tearful memories expressed uh, with losses of people in the last year. But sometimes it's also just a celebration of someone or some event from the year. The image that you see on the right is our community lantern project. So again, this is an opportunity for people to come in socially distance and take part in um, the silhouettes that you see on the lantern that is on the right of the screen. And then this is what they look like when they are lit, set afloat in our pond. Um, this is, I believe, the sixth year that this has taken place. Um, and it's a really, really beautiful event uh, that, again, just honors any individual that you choose. And we have had um, hundreds of these afloat on the pond in years past. And we're hoping that, again, it's going to reach that same fullness in 2021. 
One other thing that we had in January was an opportunity to honor Martin Luther King. And again, this is something that was a virtual experience. We had peace flags, like the very traditional Tibetan peace flags in cotton. Um, each one of those colors even has a connection to beliefs about uh, peace and remembrance. Um, uh, and people in the community, as well as children in the community, decorated these flags with remembrance, remembrances or messages of peace. And then they were strung around our pond and they stayed up through January and February. So you could come by, look at the messages that were there from children and members of the community um, while they were on display. And we feel like this is another way that we can recognize his words and also get the community to think about what does it mean to be part of uh, a movement towards peace and unity in our community. Certainly we had a, uh, lots of ups and downs in 2020 in terms of what was going on in Wilmington and many other cities in this past year. So as we looked at ways to connect with people virtually, we took our education and our connection tours into the virtual realm. Um, does anyone know what a connections tour is? So our connection tours are an opportunity for people who have, um, maybe it's Alzheimer's, maybe it's dementia, um, they were traditionally done on Mondays when the museum was closed. Our education tours could take place any day of the week. Um, but the connections tours were an opportunity for people to experience the museum in the galleries in a way that was um, smaller in number and um, also in ways that would help them experience the works of art, no matter what sort of uh, sensory or language uh, abilities that they may be experiencing due to th something like dementia or Alzheimer's. So this is something that we are continuing to do, but we have turned it into a virtual experience. You're looking there at my two colleagues, um, Georgia uh, Mastroini and Luke Travers. Um, and so with camera in hand and a cart, we have gone into the galleries to turn that into a virtual experience for people to still do either at home. So this is something that you can do at home with a loved one who may even be um, just homebound uh, because of circumstances due to COVID, or we're still partnering with um, local organizations like, uh, or local homes like um, the senior, center at um, Plantation Village uh, and other locations where we will take you into the galleries virtually and have conversations with works of art. Uh, so this is what it might look like in a traditional setting, but if people are not ready to come back, you can still experience something like this virtually. So again, it can be with a small group over Zoom or it could be with one person um, and a family member over Zoom. And we uh, love this idea that you could be here in Wilmington and you could connect even with a family member who's far away over an experience like this with a tour through our connections program right now while people are still kind of shut in uh, and not ready to come back into the galleries. And then I thought I would take you through some of the exhibits that we have right now. Um, in the image a moment ago, you're looking at some uh, exhibitions that have passed, but right now we have some gorgeous nature uh, themed exhibits in the museum. So I'm going to ask you, if you will, to come up with a title of the works of art that come on screen. Um, one of the things that we do with our tours is to let it be something that you are part of that conversation. So it's not just about telling you the history of the art and the artist, but rather what do you experience while you are there looking at the works of art and walking through the galleries. So I'll show you an image and there's no right or wrong answer here, but what might be a title that you would give for this work of art? And I'll get you started. 
So um, I might give a title like uh, Springtime Clouds to this work of art. What comes to your mind? A bright morning. Okay, a bright morning. Wonderful. I accidentally lost you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. A minute. Oh. So, Timber, what was what was the title you gave? Um, uh, the <laughs> clouds, uh, springtime clouds. I kind of, you cut out for a second on my end too. So I was trying to make sure I didn't say the same one. For me, I think I would just go with reflection. Definitely. It has that quality. And that, that is yeah. what you're looking at here. Um, this is the work of Elizabeth Bradford. Um, and she is someone who travels throughout North Carolina. She lives in the Charlotte area. She does a lot of hiking and kayaking. And so she's very close to nature and the history of land with farming in her own family. Um, so her works really capture that spirit of being outside, but it's not necessarily in a fully representational way. So you're seeing these reflections of a tree in water, um, but it's as if you're looking into the water up at the sky sky of the, the clouds above. And so it has this wonderful kind of magical um, orientation to it. I'll show you one more of her works. And same game. What kind of title might you give for this work of art? You didn't know you were going to be quizzed this morning, did you? <laughs> I'll go. I think maybe springtime marsh. Springtime marsh. Great. Okay. I see two old friends here. Oh. Yeah, I was I, I was going to Rachel took part of mine. It was going to be a beautiful marsh or whatever, but marsh was going to be in my answer also. Definitely, great minds think alike. <laughs> well, it's also like reaching out because the limbs. You th if you think of them as two friends the limbs are kind of moving toward each other. Absolutely. And isn't it beautiful how she does that both above ground, but also in the reflections of those yellow grasses down below. So it's like connection on both the top and the bottom of the painting. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so this is the spirit of her work. She is in the Hughes wing at our um, museum and her work will be on view through October. Um, so beautiful use of color. Um, and again, all throughout scenes that are in predominantly North Carolina, but she also has some images from her travels uh, up north where she went to New York to see her son. So there's even a really glimmery, snowy picture in her landscapes. Um, but they, again, they have this really magical quality to them because of the colors and the ways that she takes some bits of abstraction in the way that she paints from the things that she has seen in her hiking and kayaking. And while she is in one wing, the other artist, Robert Johnson, is in the brown wing. So again, it's unusual for us to have two exhibitions that are so closely related in terms of the themes, uh, but he is also someone who is steeped in nature in his works of art. Uh, so one more time and with a very different kind of feel to it, um, what might you give as a title for this work of art? I 
don't think I can come up with a good one. I'm not really sure what to, to focus on. How, tell me, tell me one of the first things you notice in the painting. Um, so the, I, I, the first thing I saw was the bird, the eagle that's on top of the plant, but then also underneath, I can't tell, is that, is that water, like a pond? Yeah. It's like ducks maybe? Yeah. At first I thought maybe they were underground. Oh, that's interesting that you say that. Yeah, because he's he's done something kind of unusual with, with all of those birds on the on the water. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mr. George, what do you see? Oh, oh you're muted. We can't hear you, Mr. George. It, it was strange that you, you would see different things at different sections of this painting. And like, like Rachel was saying, the, the ducks on on a pond or <laughs> you know the trees plus the insects or birds or whatever is flying mm -hmm. and, and, and it was it's interesting that he has gotten all of these things into this picture yeah yeah, you're drawing ex exactly from like that experience that he wants you to have when he's looking at when you're looking at this picture. I'll tell you a little more about him in a, in a moment. Brenda, what are what are you noticing? Well, I'm noticing on top of the flower, you know, is a bird. It's a different bird. Uh huh. But yeah. black with a, a white head. Yes. It's almost you know like when I've seen impression impressionist is 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 different than this but in a way this is kind of impressionistic too because the um the birds it's like a almost like a what's what's their head and their nose uh, also could look like a strawberry or a chocolate covered <laughs> strawberry and you know, it's, it's like great. in the way and the way that bird is placed it's you know you almost miss it and then the the little birds, different birds down in the little vines, and then you wouldn't have the really the the big vine coming down over water like that, you know. It's a uh, so it's kind of impressionistic to kind of give you a a thought about nature, not the reality of the picture itself. That is so well said. It is really about the thought of nature. This artist is someone who has done studies in all 41 of our state parks. I don't know about you, but I am way under uh, traveled in terms of the state parks that we have here. And we've got this glorious uh, collection of parks, everything from Carolina Beach State Park right near us all the way across into the mountains. And he has traveled to all 41 parks and he does sketching while he's there on site. But then when he goes back into the studio, he does exactly like what you were saying, where he's giving you kind of this impression of nature by putting together different things from what he was looking at. So everything from the eagle that's on top and then the different kinds of trees that were there, but then also other birds that he saw like the heron, and the kingfisher and then the ducks or cormorants that you're seeing in a pattern in the water down below but he kind of collages it into one painting so you're right it gives yeah. you this kind of impression of his memory from being in the park and um, this one is um, just one example from uh, not too far of us near raleigh at jordan lake state park and then here's another one. So what do you notice in this painting? The first thing I noticed was on the right side, the trees that are poking out. And that's when I realized you almost have to turn your head yeah. each direction to see all. Mr. George, you agree? Yeah. Yeah, you kind of look at it from four, like there's four viewpoints, I suppose. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in a way, it's like you're looking down, say, on this tree, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but to get the full view, you got to turn your head or your sight at a different angle to get different views of it. Because as you, as Rachel said, in the, in, on the right there, you got 
trees that's on the side, but at the bottom of the picture, uh -huh. you have everything that's straight up that's uh -huh. natural to your view that you don't got to turn your head. And the trees are not on the side, you know. And then at the top, you got trees upside down. <laughs> and ducks upside down, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the birds are flying in, in different directions. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's almost, I don't know if he's trying to make you think about the different parks or if he's making us some kind of other statement about life with this or maybe both. Yeah. You're spot mm -hmm. on again, Brenda. Um, each each one of these, so everything that you guys are seeing is exactly true. Um, and I'm so glad that it comes across even on a, a computer screen because when you stand there in the gallery, you do, you wanna do this and this yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because each side of the painting is a view from a different lake. And so these are four bay lakes in our area. Um, and when you stand in front of it, you can absolutely see you know, right side up that same sort of quality of water and trees, but then it's reflected um, up above. And yet each one has its own little distinct view of what he saw while he was there. So up here where he's seeing the swans, or uh, here I believe that this one is um, Lake uh, Wakama, um, where you see a more sandy beach, but each side was done actually instead of him standing up at the easel he went ahead and laid the painting down because he liked painting flat and it's a really large painting and he literally turned the painting around while he was working on the different areas and so each one is a view from one of the four bay lakes in our area in our state parks and then in the center you're getting a view of some of the specific wildlife like the um, prothonotary warblers or the um, butterflies or mushrooms that you see um, in the different parks so he does these wonderful kind of compilations of scenes and specific plants and birds that he um, will sketch while he's on site in the park but then he puts them together into these large finished paintings and both kinds of works are on view in the galleries so at the same time that you're looking at like a little painting that shows you the studies that will be next to a really large painting like you're seeing there on the right hand side and robert johnson is based in the mountains um, but he spent the last three years working on this series of all 41 state parks, again, starting in um, the eastern part of the state and going across into the mountains. So when you come to the uh, camera right now, you can see all of these works of art that are tied to our natural world. And it's really nice to celebrate being outside after the year that we've had where we felt like we've needed to be inside where we feel safe. Actually being outside in nature, that was one of the places where he felt, and also he talked about a story that he had with his granddaughter where, you know, you feel the most safe being outside in nature in the last year where you could even be away from other folks and just hiking in the parks. So it's a real celebration of that experience and this exhibit closes august 1st so you have a narrower window to see his works any qu questions about that i don't like their work is so beautiful i don't want to lose sight of anything else that you might want to know about robert johnson or elizabeth bradford no, but i think the works are this i like them both but this work requires more thought to see you know how you feel about it versus you get the other one quicker, I think, because he's not, he's, he's putting in all the features that he sees, but the way he's doing it is still trying to give you an impressionistic kind of message about how he feels about it. Absolutely. It's not just the literal, you know, what, what you would see on the ground. It's the things you would see, but not in the way that you would see them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have had so many people come in and tell me that they've come back time and again, just so that they could see all of those details. So yeah. definitely, I invite you to come. I, I was wondering, and it, and it kind of 
jumped out to me was that if I go to the museum today and see this picture, and then I go back tomorrow and see the same picture, I would get a different impression as to what it represents. Mm -hmm. Because so it's true. Not, it, it won't be the same each time you view this painting. It's so true. And not only that, after looking at his paintings and then you go outside and you're looking at leaves and trees and birds differently because you spent time looking closely at the things in here. So you're noticing, oh, that, you know, flower open today or, oh, you know, here's that leaf that actually has this beautiful blemish on it. It really does wake up your senses to what's going on. And of course, here in the springtime, it's a great time to look at these paintings. So definitely come and, and, and either that or schedule, you know, a tour with us. Like if, if you know someone where a connections tour would fit um, and we'll do a virtual experience with you. So I, I have to share just a little bit about our classes. I'll take you through um, those uh, while I have you here today so you get the full picture of what we do. So gallery tours, there are public tours every Wednesday at 1.30. So you come into the museum and you can join a tour. And then we also do gallery talks where we have um, visitors like this was Chris Helms with the State Parks. Um, he's at Carolina Beach. He gave a public talk on a Thursday night. We have one coming up on uh, Saturday the 15th with Amy uh, Grant, a gallerist here in Wilmington. And so that gives you this sort of outside uh, person's viewpoint to the works that are on exhibit at the museum. And of course, we have a docent program. So if you are someone interested in volunteering and you want to be, a, you could be a volunteer or you could be a docent, but you're looking here at a docent training with a tour experience at the museum. So our docents are really key for, um, really key for helping people, whether youth or adults, experience the exhibitions at the museum. And one other exhibit that is up right now is a quilt exhibit. So one of our most recent projects that we did with the community was an opportunity for people to make a cloth square telling their COVID um, story on a, a fabric square, and then Bobby sewed them together into a series of quilts. So you have three quilts on exhibit from uh, members of our community, and also three quilts from the Advocacy Project, which is a um, local, not local organization, but Bobby is involved in it, a national organization that works internationally to tell the stories of people around the world and to support them in some of things that they are needing to do, particularly women many times. Um, and they have their quilt stories on view along with our local um, participants in the reception hall right now. We have a cafe where you can stop in um, and get a bite to eat um, or just grab coffee. And along with the cafe, um, we have Art Buzz um, and also uh, activities. So this is an activity that took place last year where cakes were made and children were invited to decorate the cakes. And this was in celebration of Wayne Thibault. Um, so we have some of his works in our collection. And this is, again, how we like to get the public involved in experiencing works of art. That can also be with an Art Buzz event. So Art Buzz are part of our classes where you make a work of art, but then you also get a, a fun beverage from our cafe. And that can be something like wine or beer, or it can be um, you know just some other beverage of your choice. So we have mimosas coming up in May. We have uh, coppered leaves coming up in June, a mug making class coming up in July. And these are just fun two and a half hour classes. Um, we also have drawing that's due to return in the fall for figure drawing. Uh, and this is an image of another weekend workshop that we had. Uh, so we're trying to keep things socially distanced and really safe taking advantage of our porch at Panco for people to learn um, where they can be either inside or outside experiencing some particular technique. 
And just to share some of the other classes that we have, watercolor, um, oil painting, pastels. These are four week session classes that you can be involved in. Some of them like the watercolor are in person, but the oil painting is something that is virtual. So we're still keeping alive virtual classes. And um, also drawing, that is something that's going to be in person that's coming up next week, another four session class. But we also have short classes and weekend workshops. So I recently did a short uh, three session drawing class. Uh, Judith Chandler held a foundations class in painting. Um, and uh, Judith also had a, a boutique class that was a weekend workshop. So wonderful opportunities where you can come in and learn um, or you can have longer multi session classes. And we have a fun tea for two class coming up. I love the idea of like a mother daughter. It's right after Mother's Day weekend where you can come and learn and you can also learn with your little one to make a teapot. We have writing art appreciation and mindfulness. Uh, so uh, writing has been held virtually. There's been virtual classes in legacy writing and memoirs. Uh, we also have a one day workshop in mindfulness coming up with uh, cyanotypes or yoga meets every Wednesday morning at nine before the museum opens. So lots of things, whether it's for writing or mind and body, we're trying to consider all of those class offerings within um, the spectrum of what we have at the museum. When and there's doing, music. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Whenever you're doing the art classes, is there a level that you expect the participants to be on when they come in or can they be fresh off the grid, so to speak? No, that's a fantastic question. Um, a lot of the teachers offer something that is multi level and then they meet you at your ability. So if you are someone who's more advanced, they'll help you advance those skills. Um, something like a drawing class, Todd is specifically saying that that is for beginners. And um, with the watercolor instructor, she's going to be offering some classes that are specifically beginner or intermediate. So that'll be stated in the instruction, um, the description of the class. It's a great question, Brenda. Thank you. And where would we find the, I, don't, I want you to continue with other stuff, but, but where would we find the schedule? Because I'm not going to, you know, for all the different things you're talking about, I won't oh, remember. Oh, sure. It's on our website. Um, so the very last slide that I have is for our website. So at CameronArtMuseum.org, you can go to our museum school tab uh, with classes and workshops, and that will have all of the different classes that we have available. Okay. Yeah. And you can also call me and I'll talk you through anything too. Okay. <laughs> so I'm there at the museum every day. Um, our visitors, visitor services staff can also talk you through anything, but you're absolutely right. The best way to go and review anything is from our website. It'll show you um, classes at the museum school or programs and events like the music concerts that we've been having in the galleries or in the reception hall. Um, it'll give you those dates and times. So I know I've bombarded you with a lot of information, but and I thank you for listening to um, all that we have um, available. I have a quick question for you. If anyone is interested in volunteering or going through the program that you mentioned, what's the best way to um, get in touch with someone about getting more information? Are there any requirements? You know, how many days a week you have to be involved? Anything like sure. that? Sure. So our volunteer program is very open. There is a form that you fill out. Um, Nan Pope is in charge of the volunteers um, and also membership. So if you call or stop by the museum, you can speak with her um, and she will basically uh, gather information. You tell us your skill area and your availability, and we will work with you. Um, docents as well. Our docents are not art historians or artists per se. They are people from all walks of life. And then we train you through ideas that we have for how to help people experience the works of art in the galleries. Um, and you know, we will try to work with you and your schedule for when you are available for either public tours or school tours with the children. Wonderful. Does anyone else have any questions?
Well, thank you guys yeah. so much. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and, and I do hope, um, let me stop that so we can see everyone again. Um, I do hope that um, you can stop by and see the works in the gallery while they're still there. Um, uh, exhibitions Definitely. change all the time, but the, the nature ones are just fabulous to go through. And I didn't realize all the offerings that you had and classes and everything. So that's wonderful. And we've been talking with um, Kelly about things that we can offer virtually through the Senior Resource Center. So look for more information about that. I think we talked about doing a sort of survey so that we um, make sure that we're offering things that are of interest to you, either virtually or even there at the Senior Center um, as a place for you to come in and have a small workshop. I will definitely follow up with Kelly on that and get some more information to you guys as soon as we get those details finalized. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time and your wonderful presentation. I agree with Brenda. There's, there's so much that you offer that I wasn't aware of being a little new to the area. It makes it a little hard, but I agree. There's just so much that, that you guys do and we appreciate all the work you do for our community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Definitely take advantage of it. Absolutely. Well, I, I don't have much more for you guys today. I know we followed up um, yeah. last week about registering for classes that we have um, at the Senior Resource Center. I wanted to just check in real quick, make sure you guys didn't have any other questions about that process. Mr. George. Oh, no. Uh, I, what, uh, I just got a, uh, I was just going to say that I got the uh, email from uh, Vicki. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. About, about the uh, ding, 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 bingo class thing. Bingo. And so, wonderful. Yeah. Yes, I will have um, the cards um, for you all um, to help me out. I really appreciate you doing that. I'll have those at the front desk starting next week. You can just pick those up at the end of the week. Um, I believe the sixth or the seventh, whatever day works for you. I think that's a Thursday or a Friday. If it doesn't, just get with Vicki um, or myself and I'll, I'll get one to you at a different time if that needs to happen. Um, yeah. But I'm really looking forward to y'all helping me out with that. Okay. Yeah, because I think uh, on the, we have to turn in our time sheets by the fifth of the month. So, yes. okay, yeah. oh, on the fifth? Yeah. It, okay, then I'll have them up there by the fifth. Then I'll send her another message and, and say that we'll do it by the fifth. Yeah. Um, so you can pick them up as early as then. And if you need to come by later in the week, um, they'll still be there. So I'll have those there for you guys. Um, that way on the 10th, um, that afternoon, you guys will be able to join. Um, it'll be a little different. I'm hoping when we do the um, actual game, we'll have the little markers that you put. Um, for this one, though, I believe what we're going to do, because um, I don't think we'll have them in in enough time, we have to order them. And I believe we'll just have you mark on the page um, and you can throw the page away at the end of it. And um, they are just or recycle them. They are um, paper. So but I appreciate it. I'm glad you got that email. If you need anything or have any questions, let me know. But I'll send Vicki a note um, as soon as we're done here. Um, and then for our senior in the news story, I thought this one was really cool. Um, there is a gentleman, he is 93 years old. He lives in Ohio. Um, he's retired Air Force. And during um, the pandemic, like many people, he took up a new hobby. Um, he said, there's never, you know, you're never too old to pick up a new hobby. So he started woodworking um, at 93 every day. And he has been building um, or creating um, walking sticks. And then he sets them out in his front yard um, in like a big, one of those big trash cans. Um, and he sells them to people that drive by for $3. Um, and then he takes the money and he donates it to their local area um, food pantry. And so he sold out his first um, set. Um, I guess he made quite a few walking sticks because he made $600 the first <laughs> time that he did that. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was really cool. I um, have never considered woodworking myself, but he's he's 93 and he gets out in his wood shop every day and he has made uh, quite an impact for their for the food pantry with the money that he's um, you know gathered. Um, but all his walking sticks too, he handcrafts them, so he's whittling them um, by hand. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, because anyone it's, have missed? It's 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 a bargain. 
because uh, if you go in a store that sells walking sticks, you will see mm -hmm. that uh, there's probably about a three to four times the price difference mm -hmm. with what he's selling them for and what you can purchase them in a store because walking sticks are really expensive. Oh so, yeah. Yes, definitely. I don't, I don't even remember how much I paid for mine. I got one that was made uh, from a woodworker in Cherokee. Yeah. And I hand done and uh, oh boy, that's uh, it was a walking stick, you know? Yeah. You, and so it's uh, really, it's, they're really expensive. So $3, I mean, you know. <laughs> Give me a he dozen. And he's not, even, uh, <laughs> he's not even keeping the profit. He's donating all of it. Right. So I and thought that, that was really awesome. Thing. But you're right, they are expensive. Yeah. Those are, those are not a, um, a cheap item. So no, no. And, good and, for him. But I thought that was really cool. I wanted to share. And, 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 well, and do you guys say, have any questions or anything for me? I don't think so. I don't think so. All right. Well, we will go ahead and wrap up for the day. Thank you again, as always, for joining. I appreciate you all very much. And if you do need anything, of course, anytime, feel free to give us 